Hello YouTube, Dave here again. So a couple months ago I made the conscious decision to discontinue running D&D Adventurers League for my regular monthly game that I was doing out of, uh, that I'm still doing out of Giant Robot Comics. Uh, I've just kind of switched over to more or less a, um, a home game uh, kind of idea, but I still use like the Adventurers League character creation rules as well as leveling systems, stuff like that, because I, I do like those aspects. Uh, of the uh, of what Adventures League was, <clears throat> um, for the entire time that I was doing Adventures League up until the last few months, I was running exclusively hardcover material. So I started running uh, Tales from the Awning Portal. I ran the Sun the Citadel, and uh, I transitioned from that into uh, Tomb of Annihilation, which I'm actually still running uh, to this day with the players finally uh, having been in the tomb now for uh, a couple of sessions. So my experience, like I've done videos talking about like what to expect for Adventures League and things along those lines, but uh, at the time that I recorded that video, my only experiences with Adventures League were the hardcover adventures that I was running. Uh, so a few months ago, I had a chance to actually run one of the uh, Adventures League modules, and uh, I kind of want to talk about that today. There's, there's been a couple of them that I've run, but there's definitely some issues that I had with the adventures, at least that I ran. I'm not going to talk about the all of them, I'm just going to focus on the first one uh, for this video, but if you want to hear how some of the other adventures went, uh, you know, let me know and I can certainly let, uh, do a video on that in the future. So, uh, actually, for the adventure that I ended up running, I didn't initially plan on running it. Uh, I was going to a like a Saturday uh, Adventures League game at Monster Comic Lounge in Halifax, and that was sort of my like refuge f as a player. Like that was the the place where I finally got to play as a player character for the first time in um, like six seven years. So I showed up, you know, one week. Now the the Saturday games weren't as um, cohesively planned out as they had one during the week as well. Uh, that I've never gone to. So it's usually more of a sort of pickup and hopefully that there's going to be DMs there to run uh, Adventures for the Tables. Uh, so when I got there, uh, there was a table that needed some players. And uh, the person that was going to be running the game was a uh, was a young girl. Uh, I think in like middle school, like late middle school, maybe early high school, I can't remember. Uh, but she was there with her father and the, she was going to DM an adventure. And I thought that I might be more useful uh, to that table than the one that I started that I was going to be at, uh, which had a much more experienced DM. So I, I made the, the switch over. Uh, the adventure that I that she picked and that I ended up running, and I'll, I'll I, I guess basically what happened was there were some issues with the adventure itself um, in the way that I think some of the pages were out of order in the in when it was taken out of the binder. Like I don't think they were put back properly. Uh, but anyway, you know, when she was kind of struggling, I just said, well, do you mind if I ha have a look at this? <clears throat> and uh, maybe I can help, you know, help make sense. And uh, she passed it to me, and I started reading through it, and then she basically just asked if, I, if I'm, you know, if I'm a DM, or if I've DM before, and it's like, yeah, I have, and then I ended up running the, that adventure. So, uh, the adventure that I ran was one of the ones that took place during the Elemental Evil storyline. <clears throat> so, this wasn't one of the more recent adventures. Uh, so my experiences are from like the earlier generations of Adventurers League modules, so it's very possible that my experiences with like the way that the adventures were, my sort of criticisms about the way they're written, uh, may be something that just you know got phased out relatively early on, but based off my experiences, that hasn't really seemed to be the case. Uh, now, when I was playing as a player, most of the sessions was, again, a hardcover. Uh, we were going through Out of the Abyss. So, uh, I start reading through the adventure, and it takes place, uh, like I said, it was during the Prince of the Apocalypse storyline, and it took place in the city of Molemaster. <clears throat> and the, the basic premise of the adventure was that a nearby village was completely destroyed um, in some sort of conflagration. And it's a mystery exactly what happened to it, but uh, a noble woman has learned that there was one survivor uh, from that village who made her way into Molemaster. And she was basically found unconscious, badly burned, she had like, you know, kind of like orangey red hair. 
<clears throat> and she was taken to a, um, I don't want to say field hospital, but there was a there was a building that was set up by the Church of Ill Matter uh, to do like triage stuff, just to, to treat, you know, wounded, but it wasn't like magical healing or anything. Uh, so I guess you could say it was some sort of like a clinic uh, kind of idea. Uh, and the priests there were more or less just trained in like the medicine skill. Uh, so she was taken there, and she was immediately placed under the guard of Mole Master's uh, secret police kind of thing. And I, I think their name was the Ravens. Uh, it's been a while since I ran it, so some of the details are a little bit fuzzy. But uh, this noble woman, whose name was Lady Zora, I think it was, and I kind of remember that because, you know, Zora kind of lines up with Legend of Zelda. But anyway, whole other whole other thing there. So. She hired the party to basically get this, get the woman away from you know these secret police uh, kind of things because they are known for being corrupt and you know suspected that they were trying to like protect her from um, from or trying to kidnap her or something like that or they were going to take her. So they were, it was not the most explained <clears throat> um, explanation or reason for why she wanted uh, this woman in the first place, but the player characters were to take her from where this like. Uh, clinic was uh, to Lady Zora's manor, which was sort of uh, further outside of the main part of the city. So it was, you know, I, I, I didn't mind the initial setup, um, but there were some things that I had some issues with. So I, I guess I'm just going to kind of get to it right now. One of the biggest problems that I have with some of these modules is that they are extremely uh, railroading uh, in terms of what happens in the adventure. Now, in the video where I talked about things to expect from D&D Adventures League when you go in, uh, I had mentioned that you should expect there to be like some railroading as far as the plot is concerned. But, um, and I don't know how well I explained it, but for me, the context of that sort of railroading is this is the premise and the setup of the adventure. This is the basic quest that the players are given, <clears throat> and that's where, and you go from there, and then the players kind of decide how to, how to take things from that point forward. Uh, I, you know, assume that the players' actions would inf impact the developing of the story as it unfolds. But with the module that I ran, and, and the modules actually that I that I've run, I've kind of come to notice that that's not necessarily the case. So. It starts off pretty early because the player characters, when they they get the woman out, and so what they did was there's four guards uh, posted uh, over her. So two were at the entrance to the building, and two were sort of at the foot of her bed where she was bandaged up and again just laying there unconscious. So the uh, the characters had you know to choose how they were going to proceed which is something that I liked and I, I liked you know they kind of discussed the, the various plans uh, before they decided that the easiest course of action was to uh, bribe the guards because they are corrupt and uh, very bribable and uh, take the woman through some back alleys so in the clinic there was a back door that opens up into an alleyway uh, and they could see that because, you know, the, the guards weren't stopping people from entering the clinic. Um, so, you know, someone could go in, kind of look around, um, and things like that. So one of the characters uh, really heavily bribed the guards. It gave them like 25 gold or something like that. It was a ridiculous amount uh, that was given. But I guess at the same time, you know, we all knew that the changes were coming uh, in terms of like gold pieces in Adventures League. So maybe you didn't feel the need to hold on to them. I don't know. But... Um, so he bribed the guards, and then they, they got the woman, they took her out into this back alley. Uh, they wrapped her up in some blankets so that it wasn't super obvious, but it was still kind of obvious. So uh, they didn't want to just carry this unconscious woman through the streets. They wanted to find a way to uh, make it look like, you know, they're just going about their business kind of thing. So the players asked if they could find, like, a cart or something that they could, they could put her in and, and take her to this manor. So I said, sure, you know, make an investigation check to see what you kind of, you know, uncover. Um, because they'd have to, like, look around and maybe, you know, inquire, uh, you know, stuff like that. So uh, I had uh, each of the players, I think, make this investigation check, and they all rolled pretty poorly. Like, I think the highest investigation was, like, a 7. So it was not good. But at the same time, you know, it's like, it's a city, you're going to find something. So they found a cart. 
it was a hand cart that's designed to be pulled by a person, not like, you know, a, a beast of burden or anything. Uh, and the cart was one of the carts that goes around the city <coughs> with a, you know, person with a shovel that scoops up the horse droppings. And because they rolled as low as they did on their investigation, the only cart that they were able to get was one that had a pretty, you know, heavy payload, so to speak. Uh, but it kind of worked to their favor, so they wrapped this woman up very uh, tightly, and uh, they left just a little section uh, open for her to breathe, and then they carefully placed her in the cart and um, piled the horse poop on top of her in a way to sort of camouflage her. Uh, the more well-dressed uh, characters in the party, like there was a rogue who was a noble, uh, and there was a dragonborn, uh, they kind of just went off ahead while one of the more common-looking characters um, just dragged the cart uh, through the streets uh, to, this, uh, to this lady's manor. So the, the first issue that I had with the actual adventure as it was written is the adventure basically says that um, regardless of what happens, uh, the, the people that want to find this woman are going to know that the player characters have her and were taking her to this location. Uh, so that information is, is just made available. It's like, so regardless of what they did, they were going to be found out. They were going to be made. And I really dislike that because, you know, it, it's a situation where if the characters are very, very careful and they make a lot of, like, I mean, they spent probably about a good 20 minutes, a half an hour, discussing their plans for getting this woman to this, uh, this manor. And to have them go through all of that thorough planning, to have them, you know, make what I would consider to be a lot of the best decisions possible to them, only to say, well, I mean, it's still somebody knew what you were doing, and they tipped off, you know, the bad guys. It just, it, it I didn't like the way that that, uh, that that worked out. And there was a, not really much of a reason to do so, because the bad guys could still find out where this woman was uh, from the next section of the adventure. So the next section... Uh, had a situation where the, the characters arrive at uh, Lady Zora's manor. And, you know, it's later in the evening, it's, you know, getting late. Um, but they arrive, they have a few drinks, um, they kind of talk a little bit. Uh, they put this woman into one of the spare rooms. Uh, and there were, I think, I think there were enough spare rooms for, I think there were like four spare rooms. So she was put in her own, her own private one, and then the players kind of split up how they wanted to, to do things. Now, the Lady Zora's servant was actually um, sort of blackmailed, if I recall correctly, into working for the, the villains who want to find this woman. So once they arrived with this woman, then the servant could simply try to get a message out. And to me, that was the better way to explain how the bad guys found the characters at this manor, rather than saying, well, they were spotted along the way. So I don't know why they decided to have, like, both situations and still expect that the characters were going to be made before they even got to the manor, but anyway, uh, they did. Uh, another assumption, so after the, the characters sort of had their, their talk, Lady Zor decides that she's going to retire for the evening. And at this point, I let the players decide what they wanted to do for their characters. And uh, two of them, or three of them, I think there were five players? No. I can't remember, I, I think it was four or five players. I think it was four. Uh, so two of them, yeah, it was four to start. Yeah, so two of them went up to bed, and they, they retired immediately uh, after Lady Zora did. Uh, then there was a human paladin, I think, was the character. Um, not the most paladin of paladins, uh, but she decided that she was going to stay up and uh, do some drinking. So I was like, okay, uh, so you do that. And then the uh, the Dragonborn, who I believe was a, yeah, he was a warlock, I think, uh, getting ready to go into Hexblade, which I think you choose at the third level. So he decided that he was just going to stay up and read uh, in Lady Zora's library. So the the next part of the adventure has the, the bad guys basically um, just infiltrating and with ridiculous numbers of, of monsters and enemies. Uh, enter this manor and attempt to retrieve this woman and set fire to everything. Uh, so the the adventure states that, you know, four hours after the characters uh, arrive, that's when the attack happens. 
Uh, and so the characters should all be asleep. Uh, this is what's written in the adventure. The characters should all be asleep, but it's, uh, but it's okay for them to sleep in armor, even though they normally wouldn't, which is a really weird... Just I, I don't like the way that was worded, because I thought that was stupid. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it basically states that none of the characters sh really should be awake, so unless they have a really good reason, and it just it really just takes again the choice out of the, the player's hands. It's like, well, you know, they really should be doing this. You know, they shouldn't be you know aware when this fight breaks out. You know, they should be they should all be asleep unless they have a really super good reason uh, not to be. But you know, because you don't want to have your characters caught in a bad situation your fighters could be sleeping in their full plate. Which just baffles me, but anyway. So, uh, a group of cultists basically attack this manor. And because, you know, I wasn't going to force the characters to sleep, I asked how long the, the paladin wanted to stay up and have some drinks, stuff like that, uh, and she said one hour, which was fine. They were there for about an hour uh, before Lady Zora retired, and an hour after that, so she would be asleep uh, when the... Uh, attack happened. As for the warlock, he said, well, he was gonna just kind of stay up and read, and um, uh, he said he'd probably stay up for about four or five hours. Um, I guess, about, yeah, he said he was gonna stay up for about four hours, uh, which would put him still being awake when this fight breaks out, so I just let the fight break out with him being awake. So he's sitting in the library, just kind of, you know, reading there uh, peacefully, when all of a sudden, um, you know, this door, the door gets kicked down and a group of, it was four cultists and one cult fanatic enter the library with torches and stuff to start, you know, setting fires. And they're a bit taken back to find that there's this dragonborn sitting right there, um, because they did wait until sort of late in the night. Uh, on the top floor, so the, the manor had like two floors to it. Uh, the first floor had your common area, had your parlor, your library, had like the, the dining hall, all that stuff. And then the top floor, um, you had the stairs going up and then there was just sort of a balcony which goes all the way around um, the, the outside of the, of the floor uh, with the middle being just open so you could look over, there was like banisters, you could look over and see the, um, the, like the foyer um, to the manor and stuff like that. And then you had all your bedrooms. So the, uh, in the upstairs, there were, I think, three uh, steam methods that were setting fire to stuff up on the top floor. So the Dragonborn, uh, he had a round, uh, basically, uh, to start off things because like the, it was really unexpected and they, they came in, they weren't expecting to find anybody there. Uh, so he had his fight start in the library. Uh, the following round, the other characters were awoken by the sounds of, like, the combat, basically, and, um, like, the cackling, you know, or the, the gleeful cackling of these methods as they're setting fires uh, to stuff on the top floor, so the characters make their way out and they start fighting these methods. Uh, the human rogue decides that he is going to go check on the uh, unconscious woman that they brought here in the first place to make sure that she's okay, so he basically darts to her room, and when he gets to her room, uh, there's a group of spies, and that's what their stat block was, but there's a group of spies that were trying to kidnap her. They brought a wagon uh, up to the house, there was underneath the window, and they were going to basically try to kidnap her. So, there was basically three separate fights going on all at the same time. Uh, so we had the, the fight going on in the library with the, the Dragonborn, four cultists, and a cult fanatic. Um, and then on the upstairs you had in the unconscious woman's room, you had the two spies who was fighting with the, the rogue, uh, who was trying to protect her, and then you had um, the other two characters, which is the paladin. And I can't remember what the other character was. I, I really wish I could, but I, I just can't remember what he was. Um, and they were fighting the methods. So the methods are defeated relatively easily. Um, they didn't have the highest hit points. It's tier one adventure for like levels one through four kind of thing. Um, but they they fight them off. The rogue is holding his own against the spies because one of them tries to like get the woman while the other was fighting the rogue. Except you had some lucky attacks, the decent damage, and one of the spies goes down. Down in the library, you had the Dragonborn fighting the cultists, and the cultists weren't very effective <laughs> against the, uh, the Dragonborn. I just, it was me rolling, so I couldn't roll high to save my life.
I, I really can't <laughs> uh, for the most part. So, uh, so he was sort of holding his own there. He had his uh, Hellish Rebuke uh, ability that he had, uh, one of his Warlock abilities, uh, or I think it was one of the spells that he'd taken. He had his Dragon Breath, which did some pretty hefty damage to the, uh, the basic cultist. And in short order, it really came down to like one cultist, the Dragonborn, Warlock, and the Cult Fanatic. Uh, so that sort of is going down. Um, the, uh, after the methods were defeated, one of the, the other character who, again, I can't remember what he was playing, uh, but he goes into the bedroom to help fight off the, the, the spies. I think there was only one left by the time he got there, and uh, the rogue actually basically finished him off. So he goes, the, the other character, uh, I wish I could remember what he was playing. I think he was actually playing another rogue, but I'm not 100%. Uh, so he goes down to basically help with the uh, the Dragonborn, because at this point, the Dragonborn had finally been, been knocked down. So the Paladin went downstairs uh, after everything was secured and was able to use her Lay on Hands, uh, got the Dragonborn uh, Warlock back into the fight, and uh, it, they ended up finally taking out all the enemies. So, But in the meantime, the manor was burning pretty badly at this point because it was a it was a pretty long fight um, so you had like the building was just starting to go up uh, Lady Zora was involved in the fight as well there was an encounter in her room I believe as well written to the adventure like almost every room had some sort of monsters in there it was just a huge ridiculous number of things for the characters to fight against but I figured that the ones that they did was more than enough so uh, the characters go to retreat and they get, they have this woman, you know, they, they grab the, the unconscious woman, and uh, they take her. Uh, as well as um, one of the, uh, one of the spies, I think the last spy was just knocked out and not killed, so they wanted to question him. So they, they took him out, and the way that they got the, uh, the, the spy out of the, out of the building, from the first floor to the, uh, from the second floor to the first floor, um, they're like, so how do you want to get this guy out? Are you just going to drag him? Uh, are you going to carry him? How are you going to get him? Get, get him down to the first floor. And uh, the, the, the human thief in the party decides, he just looks, you know, drags him over to the railing um, and just says, is there anything soft uh, below the, uh, the, the balcony here? And, uh, you know, I liked where this was going. So, of course there was. There was a, uh, there was a sofa, basically, that was, you know, kind of underneath... Uh, for people, if they were waiting to meet with uh, with Lady Zora, they could sit there comfortably. Uh, so it's like, yeah, you you've got the the sofa there. So it's like, well, I I want to uh, I want to just drop them, like dump them over the thing and and drop them onto that. You know, it's soft enough; it should you know break the fall. It's not, you know, it's only like a, a ten foot drop kind of thing. So it's like, sure, uh, you know, make a dexterity check just to make sure that you're aiming in the right spot. Uh, which he did, and uh, although he he didn't roll super high, so I think the the guy kind of like bounced off the couch and then landed face first on the floor, but not enough to to kill him or anything. So then the thief, deciding that it would be easier just to kind of follow the same route, uh, made an acrobatics check to uh, to to land on the, the the first floor, and I think he rolled it was it was high, like with his bonuses it was in the twenties, so he basically did like this. Uh, the, somersault corkscrew and uh, just lands in like a sitting position with his legs crossed on the couch uh, you know looking quite dapper and fancy uh, but they they managed to get out of the building as it's kind of starts to collapse from all the the fires everything's just weakening and but they managed to get out with the uh, with the woman uh, the unconscious woman as well as a um, one of the attackers to um, to, to interrogate so they, uh, they get everybody outside, and this is, again, one of those other parts of the adventure that I would not have written. Um, but basically what happened was the, 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 the adventure assumes that the unconscious female was going to be taken. And, um, you know, the adventure was certainly designed, uh, the encounters were certainly designed to maximize the odds of that but the players persevered uh, against huge odds and they managed to rescue her or to protect her from being taken so uh, the reward for that um, and doing something that you know again took a lot of luck and you know just it was an awesome awesome fight 
oh, overall, like just a great encounter. Uh, the players really seemed to enjoy it, and it was it was awesome. But after they get the woman out, because they rescued her, but the adventure needs her to be gone, sort of, and I'll get to that. Um, they take their eyes off her for like a second, essentially. And um, when they look back to where she was, she's gone. And there's just like burning like embers on the ground where she was laying. But she disappeared sort of thing. So for all of that, um, the reward for, you know, protecting her against, you know, huge odds was that she still disappears because, you know, again, that's how the adventure was written. And I... I I mean, I ran it that way because that's that's how the the module goes, and I hadn't read like the module from uh, like from the beginning to the end. Um, like I said, I wasn't planning to run at all, so I was uh, I looked at the first couple of pages, and while they were planning things, I would sort of look ahead at the next sort of encounter section. So I didn't know how significant she was going to be later on. So when it says that she disappeared, unfortunately, she ended up disappearing. Uh, the characters were able to find the location um, where these uh, cultists and stuff came from. They followed the cart, like the the cart tracks, uh, through the streets to the manor and stuff like that. And they found it was kind of parked out front of this. Um, it was abandoned temple, I think, and it was underneath the temple actually that um, you know the the next uh, encounters took place. <clears throat> and I can't remember a lot of the, the next section except for the finale, so uh, there may be an encounter in there that I, that I skipped. I think there was one that I actually just didn't run uh, because we were kind of getting pressed for time and uh, I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to leave the adventure un unfinished. Uh, but the players they, they get down into this um, you know this the, the cultist layer sort of thing. And, um, you know, they're, they're fire cultists. I mean, it's, I guess it's obvious by the fact that they set buildings on fire and stuff like that. Uh, so they go through and they kind of explore. It's not a huge location. Uh, there was a set of, like, cells that were used or converted into, like, the cultist bedroom sort of thing. And uh, the, the final encounter took place in this sort of large open room that had, like, uh, like statuary holding this, like, huge brazier. And you had this group of cultists there. And the cultist had, like, there was this, like, glowing, like, red-hot suit of iron armor, but it was kind of like an iron armor shell sort of thing. Or maybe it was bronze armor, but it was, like, you know, metal armor that was glowing red-hot, and it was in two halves. And um, you, had, um, you had the cultist doing some sort of chant, and they had this prisoner that they dragged over to, like, this front part of, like, a breastplate of armor. And, um, you know, inside of this brazier, this burning brazier, was, again, a, like a red-hot uh, maul? It was, it was a maul or a warhammer. Uh, and the, so the characters kind of watched this happen, um, most because, you know, it was actually a pretty cool scene in flavor text, and, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that you would kind of stop and maybe, you know, just watch in, like, sort of, sort of like, um, awe kind of thing. But, uh, so as the scene unfolds, this prisoner is dragged over to this uh, front piece of armor and slammed into it. And he starts screaming, the back half of the armor, uh, you know, is, is attached basically like it, it closes like a, like a, like a DVD case kind of a kind of concept. And uh, so you got this person in there screaming, he's burning up, all of a sudden he just bursts into flames. Uh, the metal armor starts to actually meld into his flesh. And uh, instead of killing the individual, um, he just kind of stops screaming eventually, and he's just got like this, just wreathed in flames. Uh, walks over, grabs the the, the warhammer. I think it was a warhammer, warhammer or maul, whatever it was. He grabs it out of this, you know, burning brazier, and basically they created uh, an azer or azer, however you want to pronounce it, which was a really cool scene. And I will give full credit where credit is due because that was a really really awesome bit of flavor text and I thought that was a really cool moment but um, Azers or Azures they are kinda like dwarves from the elemental plane of fire so they're not made by sacrifice but you know what cool moment cool scene cool visual uh, not gonna not really gonna knock you know take anything away from that because it was just it, it, as non like canonical as it is canonical I should say uh, as it is to what the you know the Azures were still awesome, so I approve of that. 
Uh, but they noticed that one of the cultists was this woman. And so she had like the red and orange hair and uh, she, you know, she was burned. And basically, as it turns out, she was a member of the, this fire cult of Imix. Uh, and in the village, the, she received one of the, uh, the devastation orbs that accidentally triggered and uh, just destroyed the entire village. Just completely like wiped everything out. Uh, and she barely survived, sort of thing. <clears throat> so, here's the next big problem that I had uh, with the adventure. So, considering how crucial this woman was to the initial plot, um, the, the stakes that the individuals went to uh, retrieve her, and all the hassle that the player characters had to go through in order to prevent that retrieval, even though she just gets away anyway, this is where I was pretty much assuming before I read the stat blocks and everything uh, that she was going to be the, if not the cult leader, a high-ranking member of this, you know, uh, cult of the Elder Elemental Flame. Um, which is what I would have done if I was the one running the adventure. If I was the one writing it, um, she would have played a more significant part. Uh, as it turns out, she was a simple baseline cultist stat block. That's all she was. She had 11 hit points and just nothing else. She wasn't even a cult fanatic like one of the ones that attacked the manor. She was just a run-of-the-mill um, kind of like grunt foot soldier whatever just common member of this cult. Just a basic everyday cultist and she, the players killed her in one shot. <laughs> so it was just it, 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 for me, it killed a lot of, like, and everyone basically sitting around the table is like, well, wait, this, like, when they attacked her, it's like, this is going to be a huge fight, um, and she's going to be pretty tough to take down, along with this, you know, burning elemental fire creature. This is going to be one heck of a fight. But then they one-shot her, and everyone just kind of stopped and was just like, really? And I was like, yes, uh, that's, that she's dead. You, you killed her with, with 11 points, and that was it. After all that, she was that easy to kill. Like, armor class 11, and uh, 11. It, was, it was pathetic anyway, in my opinion. Um, it just, she seemed so important, and then she had, like, nothing to really do with anything. <clears throat> uh, maybe the information about her being there and responsible for this uh, devastation orb going off, maybe that played a larger role in the rest of the season for Adventures League, but in that moment, everyone at the table just kind of did a collective oh and then continued the fight uh, with the azure <clears throat> and uh, a couple other players ended up joining uh, for the end of the uh, of the of the encounter i think i actually had three players so i had four to begin with and three others joined for like the the final set of encounters just because their their table had ended up uh, had ended and uh, we still had a little bit to finish off so anyway uh, so that was my, my first experience with um, running a D&D Adventures League module. Now, again, this was one of the earlier ones from the Prince of the Apocalypse storyline, so it's possible that the, the writing styles have definitely changed, but there were a lot of things that I had uh, as issues with this adventure. Uh, so, I mean, not I don't, I don't mind railroading in you know these types of organized play modules as far as getting the players to the starting gate kind of thing. Like, this is the quest, you've already accepted it, this is what we're doing. If you don't want to do it, leave the table, find another one, or just, just leave. Uh, because you're here to play, you know, Adventures League, and this is what the adventure is for this table. And that's totally fine. Like I said, that's what I would expect when going to an Adventures League game. But to have so many situations where, regardless of what the players did, um, the outcome was going to be the same was a bit problematic. Um, so no matter how well the characters tried to hide the fact that they had this woman in the first place, they were going to be found out before they got to the manor. Uh, but that was unnecessary because the uh, Lady Zora servant was again being uh, coerced into working with this cult, um, so they would have gotten the information that way. Um, a huge assault takes place on this manor, basically destroying it, uh, to get at this woman, and to, if the players overcame the odds, the woman still vanishes. But she played zero role in the rest of the adventure. <clears throat> she was essentially useless. Um, you could have cut out 
the entire thing, uh, plot with her all together, and just had Lady Zora ask the player characters to her manner to discuss a matter of concern that she had about this, you know, the presence of this cult. And, you know, the discovery maybe of their location, and then you have the cultists who were keeping track of her because they knew that she was trying to uh, subvert their plans, have her servant kind of browbeaten, blackmailed, whatever, into working with the cult. And then when the characters arrive and start talking, he excuses himself for a moment and gets a message off to the cultists who attack in mass, not to retrieve a run-of-the-mill cultist, but to... Um, basically assassinate Lady Zora and put an end to the player characters as well to sort of keep them out of their business. The characters, if they, you know, they then, you know, overcome the challenge or they escape from one or the other and then decide to take the fight to the cultists where they oversee this ritual that creates the Asia. That, to me, would have been a tighter, more cohesive story where it didn't feel like the player's actions didn't matter. Instead, you had them rescuing, uh, or under the assumption that they were rescuing this woman, um, to, to, you know, get her to, you know, a safe house sort of thing, which gets attacked, and she disappears regardless, but she plays no role. Like, there, even the revelation that she was one of the ones responsible for the direction of the village goes nowhere in that adventure. So uh, I'm hoping that the payoff took place in a future uh, chapter or future installment because the way Adventures League works is they have multiple modules throughout the season that the, uh, the uh, that co corresponds with the hardcover adventures. But within, like, the, within a self-confined or self-contained adventure, she played no role. You could literally remove her and make the story tighter. And so that was sort of my, my biggest issue uh, with sort of Adventures League modules. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely stick to hardcovers in the future. Uh, now, there were some other uh, modules that I did end up running. And they kind of suffered again from a lot of the same stuff. Um, you know, the characters basically an encounter triggers no matter what sort of thing. Um, there was uh, one adventure that I was running that the characters were in a bar. Again, this was in Mole Master. It was part of the same season. Uh, so the characters were in this tavern and they were trying to track down a missing person, I believe. And uh, this, you know, they, there's the, one of the bar maids. They kind of question her and a fight breaks out because they question her. This group of pirates starts attacking. This big tavern brawl runs out and breaks out. And regardless of what the players do, this barmaid runs away, um, leaves the tavern sort of thing, but it really doesn't matter because they, she just kind of goes across the street or into this other building where she's easily found and as soon as the player characters arrive, she immediately tells them the information that they could have simply gotten from her in the tavern anyway. So, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, if I were to run uh, Adventures League modules, knowing that I was going to be running an Adventures League module going into an event, I would personally read through it and um, streamline the story to the point where it doesn't, it removes the need for a lot of these railroaded plot devices, um, especially if they don't matter. So anyway, that was my experience with, uh, with one of the earlier Adventures League adventures. Uh, so let me know in the comments below because again, all, most of my experience with Adventures League comes from the form of hardcovers. Uh, even my time as a player, uh, almost all of that was spent. Uh, doing hardcovers as well. So if you played through a lot of the modules, let me know if some of the more recent ones kind of eliminated a lot of those situations. Or if it's one of those things where, you know, the Adventures League modules just really have a lot of plot points that happen regardless of player character actions. Uh, anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And again, you know, please let me know about your personal experiences with AL modules because I would love to hear them. Uh, thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Take care.